We thank all the musicians today for that uh, beautiful rendition. And uh, Cheryl can bring us songs we associate in one area and bring them in here, and they sound like a whole different message. On a clear day, we can see forever. Thanks be to God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. In May of uh, 1782, an alchemist by the name of James Price announced to the elite of London society that he had figured out how to turn mercury into silver or mercury into gold. They all gathered to see this, and he first made a concoction with a white powder that he said was his secret sauce, and he mixed it with mercury and borax, and he stirred it with an iron rod, and it became silver. Then he took a red powder, which he said he had invented, and he put it in with the mercury and the borax, and he stirred it with that iron rod, and it became gold. He was the talk of the town. He was in, invited to all the big parties. James Price became a big name. And he wasn't a fake because he had a doctorate of medicine from Oxford University. That's not easy to get to, but... The scientists in London of the Royal Society of Scientists, they were dubious. They thought, ah, this can't really <laughs> be the way this works. So they said, uh, we want you to do that demonstration in front of us. And under our vigilant eyes, if you continue to do it, then we'll acknowledge that you've come upon something. Alchemy was kind of a pre-science to chemistry. And there were those in ancient times all the way up into the, about 1800 who claimed that they could mix potions and turn regular metal into precious metal. Mostly they claimed they could turn lead into gold. Well, James Price said he could turn mercury into silver and gold. And in August of 1783, after he tried to postpone and postpone and postpone, he had to get in front of the scientists and they came and they watched him but they were not fooled by his sleight of hand. And when he realized that they saw through what he was doing, James Price drank poison in front of them and died. He evidently preferred to die than to be exposed as a fraud. Now, I don't know if God changes lead into gold. I don't know about all of that, but I do know this. God can take negative things that happen to us and by us, sinful things even, tragedies, catastrophes, negative experiences. God can take those and through something I'm going to call spiritual alchemy, God can transform those negative experiences and create something precious within us. For the next few weeks, I'm going to preach sermons on spiritual alchemy and talk about how God takes some of the negative things that happen in our lives and uses them for good. This morning, I'm talking about how God can take shame and turn it into joyful service. Now, shame is the lead of emotions. It's heavy, weighty. Uh, it's unappealing. It's toxic. And yet God can even take shame and use it redemptively in our lives to create something very powerful. Now, we need to think a little bit about what shame is. It's a little different than other things. It's kind of like guilt, kind of like guilt. But guilt is a negative emotion that rises up with us over something we have done wrong. We know we did it wrong. We know it, it violates our own code. Uh, it's hard to make somebody feel guilty if they don't share your same code, by the way. You can say, oh, you shouldn't have done that, and then they go, eh, it doesn't matter to me. But if they share the code, and, or if it's sort of uh, these kind of uh, truths that are in civilized society generally anywhere, and you go against that, we feel guilt. It's about a, an action. Like if you lie, most people feel some guilt if you lie. Amen. No? Okay, well, you all work on that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think guilt, I mean, think lying makes us feel guilty. If, if a man chooses to go to a bar and watch a basketball game rather than attend his daughter's dance recital, are we catching up now? Uh, he might enjoy himself at that, at that uh, game, but when it's over, he's going to feel 
guilty because almost universally uh, fathers are supposed to support their children and not hang out at bars watching basketball games, all right? Uh, okay, he's, he's not sure. Okay, uh, we got some debate going on here. Uh, uh, guilt is over something you've done that you feel is wrong and it's got kind of a moral quality to it uh, and we all have felt guilty from different things we've done wrong. Shame is not guilt. It's also not embarrassment. Now, embarrassment is what is a negative feeling that comes up in us when our humanness ex is exposed. It's not morally wrong. It's just that our human animal side becomes apparent to others. If you get out of a, a car in the winter on a slick parking lot at the giant at the grocery store and you slip and you fall and there are people around, you feel embarrassed, right? Now, listen, no human being can walk on ice. Did you know that? <laughs> No human being can walk on ice. You didn't do anything wrong, maybe not wise, but you're not immoral for falling, but it's embarrassing. If you have a burrito for lunch and you spill the hot sauce down on your white shirt, and you don't notice it till midway through a presentation at your job, you, you feel embarrassed, right? You feel embarrassed. That's not morally wrong. Everybody spills food on their clothes. Look what you're wearing today. There's probably something there, okay? We all do that. It's just human. Uh, but when we do it and are exposed and others, we're embarrassed. That's not shame. Shame, as I am using it, is an intense negative feeling that comes over us like a tidal wave because some character defect or moral deficiency that has been in us for a long time is now exposed to ourselves and to others. And we feel shame, not about what we have done, but about a part of who we are. It's very difficult to deal with, very difficult. Now let's try to put them all in context. If you absentmindedly walk out of a department store with a pair of shoes you forgot to pay for and the security alarm goes off, you're going to feel what? This is a test. You're going to feel embarrassment because you didn't mean to. You just kind of, you know, checked out. You ever do that? How many of you? Ever, okay, all right, I think we're getting somewhere now. Uh, yeah, you do that. That's just embarrassment. Now, if you intend to sneak out of the department store with some designer shoes hidden in your purse or under your shirt or some way and you get caught, that's guilt. That's guilt. You did something wrong, stole, that's guilt. But if for years you've been stealing from your mama's purse, taking money out of your invalid grandfather's wallet, robbing your daughter's piggy bank, <laughs> siphoning off the petty cash at work so you could keep yourself in designer shoes, that is shame. Shame. I'm not talking about little personality quirks. I'm not talking about little charming idiosyncrasies. I'm not talking about a sickness that you might be dealing with. I'm talking about a character flaw. This isn't an easy sermon. This sermon doesn't play. <laughs> it's not playing. It's going right at us now, see. Do you hear it? Right at us. You've already got some clues about what I'm talking about. It may be your temper that just blows out and just blows out on everybody. It may be that you're arrogant. You think you know it all and you talk like you're the professor of life, kind of like me. It, it might be that you're a victim. Everything that happens, oh, nobody ever helps me and I never get a break and they didn't treat me fairly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It might be that you're lecherous. And, you know, you're always making these insinuating comments and uh, off-color remarks and, and putting your hands where nobody wants your hands and, uh, you know, yeah, 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 so do, yeah, yeah, I don't know what it is in you. I really don't. And I don't even have to know. I know what is in me. But there is that stuff going on. And people will come to you and say, hey, this is a problem. And you know what? Uh, we don't think it's that big a deal. In fact, we'll say, I didn't, I didn't think it was that big a deal. It is a big deal. The deeply embedded stuff that we try to hide. And you say, well, why didn't somebody tell me? They've been telling you for years. <laughs> They've been telling you for years. But it's hard for you to deal with it. I understand it's hard for me to deal with it. 
And then some people don't tell you because they're nice. Try to surround yourself with nice people and you'll never have to face your faults. Or they might be an empath and they don't want to hurt you. you know, or they might be scared of you. And they're in a vulnerable position and they don't want to call attention to this because you could take it out on them. That's what I'm talking about today. Are we communicating? Yeah. I think we are. Peter had one of these deep-seated character flaws. He had a combination of arrogance and cowardice. That's a toxic combination. Arrogance and cowardice. We see it throughout. Every time we meet Peter, he's either being arrogant or he's being cowardly. Uh, uh, before uh, Jesus is crucified and he talks about his death, then Peter says, Lord, if all the other men forsake you, I will stand uh, true. And then in John 13, Jesus tries to wash his feet and he says, you will not wash my feet. And Jesus says, yeah, but I'm preparing for my death. I will lay down my life for you, Peter says. And for a minute, it looks like he's going to. When they come to arrest Jesus, he grabs a spear, John says, and he chops off the ear of one of the militia. And it looks like, well, maybe he is bold. Maybe he is brave. Maybe he is courageous. And then he meets that little girl, the Bible says, the little girl around the fire. And she says, after Jesus has been arrested, I believe you're one of his followers. And Peter said, nope, no, 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 no. And two more strangers come up and say the same thing. And he starts cursing. I never knew him. I don't know what you're talking about. I have nothing to do with him. This is the guy who said he was going to lay down his life. This is the guy that said, if everybody else goes away, you can count on me. He is collapsing like a cheap TV tray. That's a horrible combination. Arrogance and cowardice. We call people blowhards who are that way. Does that make any sense to you? We, we call them fools. We call them windbags because they're always talking. Hup, hup, hup. Well, if I could get in there, if they called on me, you know, I am deeply afraid that our nation is beginning to be this way. That we spout off all this arrogance. We are the protectors of the vulnerable, the oppressed. We are the protectors of democracy around the world. You can always count on us. But then when stuff happens, genocide breaks out, war crimes are committed, we write a check and stay home. And, and it's not Republican or Democrat. They're all the same. And it's us too. We don't want to go. We don't want to go. I understand that. I don't even know what we should do. <laughs> I'm no general. But you can go back to Rwanda, the Clinton administration, genocide. Uh, Stern words. We're good on stern words. You better stop it. You better why I oughta. You go up into Syria, the Trump administration, ah, uh -uh, chemical warfare. You better you watch out. You go to South Sudan, the Obama administration, stop that genocide while we're going to get mad. Syria, Bosnia, Rwanda, South Sudan, now the Ukraine. You see what's going on. The president had tough words for the Ukraine, for the Russians today. That's a lethal combination. Arrogance and trepidude. If Peter's allowed to continue that way, what's going to happen to the mission of Christ once Christ is gone? And the Romans come on with heavy oppression, and the Jews come on with their heavy oppression, the Jewish Sanhedrin and all their military. What, what is going to happen to the Christian movement if Peter, who's supposed to be the leader, is all talk? Down in Texas they say, big hat, no cattle. <laughs> all talk, no action. He's got to be transformed if there's going to be hope for the Christian movement. And he's transformed through redemptive shame. Now, I want to make a quick distinction between what I'm calling redemptive shame and what John Broadshaw and others used to call toxic shame. Toxic shame is where somebody early in your life imprinted you negatively through some kind of childhood trauma, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, 
verbal abuse, gross negligence. They imprinted you negatively long ago. You didn't do anything wrong, but you carry that shame with you into adult life. We all have a little of it, but some people have a debilitating amount of it. Very difficult to shake. You have to get help and therapy and all those kinds of things. You know, Daddy said you were fat and fat and fat, and now even though you're 20 pounds under healthy weight, you still think of yourself as fat. Mama said, it's your job to make all my dreams come true, and you didn't do that, and so you feel guilty and a failure, even though that was an impossible expectation. Some teacher said you couldn't sing or you were stupid, and you carry that with you on into adulthood. That's toxic shame. That's not what I'm talking about. There's no redemption to that whatsoever. you got to find somebody to help you. Pray it out, get it out, talk it out, whatever. you got to get it out. It's, it's just not fair. But redemptive shame is where things open up in front of others and you say, oh, my goodness, what they've been saying for years is true. I am this way. And it's caused a lot of people pain, and, and it's causing me pain. Oh, my goodness. It really is as bad as they said. That happened on the night before Jesus was crucified to Peter. And then after the resurrection, though, Christ is going to come in and try to help him with that, trying to use this shame in a redemptive way. He, he walks out to the seashore. He sees the disciples. They're back fishing again. He calls them in, and after breakfast, he feeds them breakfast, and then he draws Peter to the side, and he says to Peter, he asks him a very important question. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, what he means is, do you love me more than the other disciples? He's testing him, see. Are you going to say, yeah, the rest of them are low life, but you can count on me. Have you learned anything here, Peter? That's the question. Has this shame changed you? And in the English, we don't catch the full impact, but what he says to him is, Peter, do you agape me? Agape is the word for God's love for us. It's an unconditional, exceptional love. We don't have it very often, maybe for grandchildren or something, but it's not easy to manufacture. Uh, and so he says, Peter, uh, do you love me with an exceptional, godlike love uh, that is better than all the rest? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. But he uses a different word. Oh, it's all in that word. It's all in that word. He says, Lord, I love you like a brother. I phileo you. I love you like a a friend. You see? He doesn't say, yeah, you know I'm the best one. You know I love you more than anybody else. You know I have an exceptional love. He says, no, Lord, I, I can't say that I love you like God, but I do love you like a brother. If you help me, I'll help you. And then Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you agape me? And now the pressure's on. Peter might be thinking, well, he's trying to influence me. He's trying to feed me the answer, you know. You know, when people say, did you have a good time? It's kind of hard to say no. It's lousy. You know, they've, they've given you the answer. How do you feel today? Great? <laughs> he goes, Do you agape me, Peter? This is his chance. He's going to look like an idiot if he says the wrong thing. But you see, shame has brought him back. And he says, no, Lord, but I do love you like a brother. That takes courage. It takes courage. And then the Lord asks him one more time, Peter. And this time, the Lord says, Peter, do you love me like a brother? Do you phileo me? Can you... Say that you love me like a brother. And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know what I did when you were being arrested. You know everything about my past. You know everything about my present. You know everything about the future. You know all the character flaws and moral deficiencies in me. You know, you see it all. And yet, even with all that, you know that I do love you like a brother. That's most of us, isn't it? I mean, we fail and we, we do the wrong thing. We sin, right? I mean, we, we fall apart and we, we, do the, you know, we make people hurt. Uh, but in your heart of hearts, don't you love Jesus at least like a sister? At least like a brother? At least like a friend? Can't you say, no, I don't have courageous, perfect, exceptional, uh, but I love you. 
And if I love you and you love me and I get honest about what's going on in me, I believe I can still serve you, Lord. And the Lord says, yep, come tend my sheep. Come feed my lambs. Come on and serve me. Groucho Marx was a comedian of another era. Some of you might remember him. He's also a talk show host. He said, blessed are the cracked, for they let the light in. And Leonard Cohen picked up on some of that same sentiment and in a beautiful song he wrote called Anthem, he wrote these words, ring the bells that still can ring. <laughs> I love that. Maybe you can't ring all your bells anymore. <laughs> uh, but ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. I wish I could tell you that Peter now never had any more problems with, with uh, cowardice or with arrogance. But he did. He did. You can read about it. He, he still struggled with it. Even in this passage, he says, well, what about him, Lord? What about John? How, what's going to happen to him? But we also read how he dies. And he dies being crucified for his faith in Jesus Christ, which he will not recant. He will not deny. He has a newfound courage that came from all the transformation that Christ gave to him. And it can happen to us. Are you cracked today? <laughs> Is there a little bit of cracked showing? Don't spackle it over. Take it over to God. And let God become redemptive. After the, my first marriage ended, I laid low. I didn't want to be around anybody. Certainly didn't want to come up here. I didn't want to be around anybody. But because I was trying to be a decent father, I had to go eventually to the University Park Elementary School for a PTA meeting or something. I don't remember. It was outdoors. It was about this time of year. It was, or it was in the fall, but it was nice weather and outdoors. And, and I stood out there under a tree by myself. I didn't want to be around anybody. See, And then this guy saw me, a friend of mine. He walked over and said, what are you doing standing over here? I said, well, you know, you know what's happening, and I don't feel like being around people. He said, what's happening? And I said, well, my marriage ended. Oh, I know all about that, he said. Who cares? Half the people in this yard are divorced. <laughs> but he thought I was suffering embarrassment. You hear? He thought I was saying, you're suffering what all these people suffer. It's a normal thing, a human thing. But I wasn't engulfed in embarrassment. I was engulfed in shame. I hadn't been unfaithful to my marriage. That's, that's not it. But I had character flaws and deficiencies that contributed to the end of that relationship and hurt my children and hurt others, hurt this church. And it was deficiencies that I had been shown and called attention to throughout my life, but I had not dealt with them. And now they just blew up in my face, and now everybody knew, and I didn't think I could ever come back here at all. Took me several months to get my head turned on straight. Prayer, therapy. And finally I thought, you know, I believe I can serve the Lord again. I believe the Lord can use this. I believe I'll walk a little better, closer, more dependent. And I gathered up what courage I had left. <laughs> and I came over here to preach. I was scared to death. And I walked up those stairs from the side parking lots, up those stairs. And there was a young adult man standing in here. And I knew him. And he greeted me. And I came on and preached his first sermon back. Many months later, that young adult called me and said, I didn't tell you this until now because now I can tell you. <laughs> he said, I had been exposed at my job. Well, actually, he said, I didn't even have a job. I was pretending to have one that I didn't have. And I was pretending to have talents that I didn't have. And I was pretending to know people that I didn't know. And all of that got exposed. And on that Sunday, I was actually thinking, maybe it's time to end it all. 
But he said, I saw your head. First, I just saw your head. It came up the first step, and then here we go. And then your whole body came up here. And he said, I thought, if the Lord can revive him, if the Lord can use him, the Lord can use me. And I went back into service to the Lord. The cracks are how the light gets in. If you're broken today, if you know what it feels like to be shamed, let the Lord transform that into joyful service. Amen.